Every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. Okay, so welcome to the John Schultz podcast, and we have a great guest today, Howard Lindzen. Very exciting, very exciting. I'm going to talk a little bit about his background. It could take hours, but I'm, I'm going to do the crib notes here. So, so Howard's the co-founder and chairman of StockTwits, a standalone social finance network. So it's Twitter for stocks, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk a lot about that. He's the founder of Social Leverage, an angel investment firm. He's co-host with of Panic with Friends podcast, which is killing it. It's about investing in markets. And I think actually just around this time, your, your topic's more relevant because I think we're all panicking with what's going on both here and around the world. Uh, he created Wall Strip, a business news satire program, which he uh, sold to CBS. So Howard, you are a man of many talents uh, and you've been around a long time and done great things. So welcome. Welcome. I'm <laughs> I'm excited to be on the Schultzy podcast. Is this like sh it's like Schmaltz? It's Schmaltz. Schmaltz. You can say Schmaltz. Great pitcher. I've been called Schwartz. It's Schmaltz. Schmaltz. Great pitcher. Yeah. So uh, excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, listen. You know, you 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 interview enough people, it's time people learn more about about you. So I'm here to uh, achieve that. And I, and I want to start out, I like going way back. I, I, I love how people evolve. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to learn about uh, all different stages of people's lives, at least for me. So your first job was a stockbroker and you, you would tell people how much you love it. You know, most people don't say that. So, so why was that for you when you were younger? I, I think what made... I mean, listen, I was so happy to be legally in the United States. So at the time I had done a graduate degree, I was living in Arizona, the Gulf War had broken out. It was like not a good time to be entering the job market. It was a savings and loan crisis of the early 90s. I remember and that. Phoenix kind of like Phoenix was like ground zero of every scam, as they generally are. Arizona's the Australia of America, but uh the uh so it wasn't a good time to be job hunting so i became a stockbroker which you know what a waste of a of a mba mim uh to be cold calling people but you know a great boss a great mentor you know learned a lot about like stocks and and obviously sales and my own skills of you know networking and getting people on the phone and there was no internet so it was just like you know filling out cards and picking up the phone and dialing and dealing with um you know secretaries and trying to get through the secretaries to people so it was kind of like it's not like today where you can yell at the president on twitter and uh, actually get a response from them uh you know back then you were just trying to figure out how to get it was like gordon gecko you're trying to get through to the boss and get a whale of an order so it was a whole different world yeah it could actually go into buildings without security and bring flowers. And I remember too, man, it, what, what a different world right now. It's uh, it's, it's, it's a much right. different business. Right now I talk to my Salesforce friends and like a, a kid makes two cold calls and they want to get on a drinking bus and go to a, go to a baseball game to celebrate that they made two cold calls uh, off a script. So, you know, these uh, soft millennials have it easy. You know, we were well, you know, cold they're calling not used with the rotary phone. Yep. They're not used to even using <laughs> phones, right? No, so, all right, so you, you did this stockbroker thing. What, like, what happened? I know you're, you're from Canada, so you're here. You know, you have this whole new outlook on life. So, like, where did you go from there? What happened after uh, this job? Well, you know, as part of uh, as part of the job, you would pick up the local paper, uh, the business gazette of whatever city you were in, and look for rich entrepreneurs and one of my cold calls was to, to a guy mark scatterday 
who uh, was promoting himself was having this fast growing uh, promotional product called the grip. So I cold called him. He took the meeting and ended up pitching me uh, on his business because he needed to raise money. And uh, I loved the product and um, ended up, you know, writing, uh, you know, my kind of like one of my first seed checks, even though I didn't really have the money and backing this product called the grip, which went on this incredible run. Um, so it was kind of like a lucky, you know, instinctual bet on a founder and a product in the pre-internet world that really took off. Yeah. Like, like way at the beginning, right? Uh, way at the beginning before there was, before there was um, the internet, there was QVC and QVC was like a one channel internet. And, and what I mean by that is the, um, you know, if your product was selling on TV, they would just hook, they would keep you on TV and you'd keep selling the product. You know, they hadn't figured out maximum, maximum, they hadn't maximized the idea of um, they hadn't maximized the idea of like profit per minute. So if your product was selling, they just pushed you back out there to keep selling. And therefore, you know, you would, you, we were in the, the hall of fame of QVC for our little stupid product because, you know, the, the audience of QVC loved our squeeze balls, basically. It's amazing if you really think back too, right? At the end of the day, advertising was this big black hole that you know you put on TV and you were hoping people saw your product, right? So it was more about how many people saw it. I mean, QVC really did create that, you know, gratification of seeing that things actually happen when you when you spent that dollar, right? Just sort of like the internet. And you know, if you look at where we are today, it's it's why Facebook's Facebook and Google's Google. So it's pretty interesting. Well, they're all still trying to be QVC in many ways. So like it's come full circle, right? America is a consumer and cultural. I mean, what do people want from America? Like they, they look up to our consumerism, you know, whether we like it or not, they look up to our consumerism and, and, and last but not least, as little culture as we think we have, you know, the rest of the world likes our, our, our culture around spending. Like we're tired of like culture, culture. We want like American culture. And so it's like our one great last export um, and everybody's getting in on it. But QVC was like the internet before the internet. It's always like the thing that's the thing, right? Like right now, everybody's talking about crypto, but is crypto the thing or is it the thing before the thing, right? Like, e like QVC was the internet. Like the internet, pre-internet was like in Philadelphia at the like QVC offices, which were like, floors and floors of, of people on a phone shipping you shit to store in your garage. And then boom, the internet comes, which is like a billion channels, uh, get whatever you want, whenever you want. So it's like, just when you, we thought QVC was the end all and be all, and everybody goal was to get on QVC. Cause if you got on QVC, you were a millionaire. Well, it turns out it was the opposite that happened and so you know it was just an interesting moment in time that uh we had this hit product and i learned a lot it's almost like remember the jerry lewis telethon i mean it's like it was happening even yeah. pre this and then the, it's like sort of that evolved to this and then here we are yep. today i mean look at gofundme and all these ways that you know you could do terrific things uh you know and, and address and touch a customer or, or, you know, find a community. It's terrific. All right. So you did this thing, obviously you pulled your little Gordon Gecko, right? You, you, you made the cold yep. call, you, met the money. Person, you made some money yep. and then how did stock twits? Like wh when did that come into play? Well, the whole, the whole thing was, I was this retail, like didn't have a, a, a pot to piss. And I learned a little bit about the stock market from my short stint being a stockbroker. And I realized you got to be on the other side of the phone call, much like the movie Wall Street. And, um, you know, I, I, the internet comes along and you had the like 
long 1996 to 2000 boom, you know, with the 1998 long-term capital management thrown in, which was kind of like the COVID of that era, which just kind of shocked the markets. And then the markets just exploded higher on the internet, much like COVID shocked the markets, obviously much worse because of the, the, the obviously the death and destruction, but like shocked the markets and the markets screamed higher, right? Tech came to the rescue. And so that whole era got me into stocks, right? Like everything went up and to the right. And, you know, you had the E-Trade generation and, and I was that guy on Yahoo, just like, you know, the, when I, you know, Twitter came along to kind of upend this next revolution, uh, that Yahoo generation of traders, I was one of those people and I became fascinated by the markets. I had a little bit of money. And what's super interesting about Yahoo at that time was, as any investor at that era knew, you were, we were, we thought we were the shit and we were trading with 15, 20 minute delayed quotes. Uh, like think about how ridiculous that is in a world that we live in today where there's 24 seven crypto trading and everybody's a market maker and everybody's Goldman Sachs to an era where in 1999 you were paying, you know, whatever it was, E-Trade commission, and you were paying $20 spreads on Akamai or whatever stock you were trading. And you were trading with 20 minute delayed data against everybody else. So, so you think about how far we've come and what people complain about today versus like how screwed we were back then. So my whole, my whole tr- thing was, man, retail investors are getting screwed. So when that eventually imploded, we all looked at ourselves and go, what the fuck were we thinking? Like we, we, the odds were stacked against us, even with E-Trade. And they had like, people make fun of Robinhood and Coinbase, but back then like E-Trade was doing like baby trade. They were goofing on the whole thing. And they were like, had Super Bowl commercials where they're making fun of their own customer. <laughs> and, and today, like, people get fucking woke about like options trading where in 1999, like people were slinging, you know, $20 spreads and, and, and the purveyors of, uh, of these products were doing Super Bowl commercials, making fun of the whole thing. So we've come a long way. I was inspired by that Yahoo generation to kind of build the next generation of, because I was such a big, proponent and and participant in that first bubble in 1999 and survived it and kind of thrived i just kept was on the lookout for the next wave of brokerage and retail trading and when twitter and youtube came out i basically sold everything i had and piled in 100 percent of my time and money into youtube and twitter and what do you mean by that when you say investment wise or just learning? Yeah, I mean, I was full believer in YouTube. I started buying Google, Twitter came out and I started investing in private companies around the Twitter ecosystem, TweetDeck, Bitly, Samize, and I started StockTwits. And then I started, I had an idea to build CNBC on YouTube, which was, you know, let's start like, I grew up in Toronto where Second City, you know, was like a spoof like there was a show about a cable network called Second City with John Candy and Joe Flaherty and uh, Eugene Levy. And so my whole idea was to create a YouTube version of CNBC, which was what Wall Strip was. And in 2006, I started that. And luckily for me, right place, right time, CBS liked what we were doing and bought my company like six months after I started it. Wow. It, it's, it's amazing, right? Because like you were doing all of this out of not getting what you want or feeling that you, you know, you were at a disadvantage and it was hurting you. But yet, yet, what I you know, love about you is a lot of people complain about things and they don't try. And it just seems that that's been your whole career, you know, even going back to managing money when you were a kid to, you know, you're losing money on your first trade. Most people would have quit. You know, you you, yep. you you went all in and almost got, you, you tanked yourself. So, so the yep. stock twits, but you know, takes a lot of, a lot of push. And so what were like, obviously it started, it, it, you know, was it a success right away? Like how, how did, how did stock no. twits actually evolve? 
Well, I mean, it's a good question. It's it's like an ongoing saga. It's doing better than it's ever done. Like so, so again, it's, I, I mean, the number one lesson is is learn by doing. Whether it's you know the internet or you know BlackBerry or phone, like you can't. It's easy to like make fun of these new products and toys, but I guess I was always curious enough to try and i'm very lucky in that i'm a complete tech neanderthal but so is my whole industry everybody who's interested in money is a tech neanderthal and we like yelling at people and punching things and like throwing keyboards and blaming other people for everything so luckily for me in that world relatively i'm a tech genius and um you know it was the right industry in that financial tech lags other tech by like three to five years because of the regulation right like the sec slows tech down enough in the financial industry to kind of allow laymen like myself to be innovators so you don't have to be first to market in in fintech to win like you think about venmo venmo was around for like 10 years before it was a success you know robin hood didn't start the iPhone came out in 2008 or the app store in 2009, let's say. And Robinhood, which is like now it's so obvious, wasn't even started until 2014. Right. So think about that. There should have been a thousand Robinhoods by 2011. But because of the SEC and the way brokerages worked and clearing and it took like till 2016 and it really took the pandemic to really remind people that like you could sling money around and trade and um you know the aftermath of that is people are all mad and saying we were played but really what this is is just another version of 1999 you know you onboarded 100 million new people that yeah i mean 50 million of them will get burned by the stock market more than ever but at the same time you, it's like saying i want to learn chinese and I want to speak fluently in three months. And I want to be taught Chinese by a beautiful woman in a no pressure situation. And uh, I'm never going to have to really use Chinese to get myself out of a jam. And that's the market. Like people just thought, oh, it's a bull market. I'm never going to lose money. I always win. And guess what? You got to learn the language. And it's not just about looking at prices and trading. It's about understanding how markets work. And you get, there's very, there's tremendous subtleties to the language of investing and trading. And guess what? People are learning that like, it's like learning Chinese. You can't learn it overnight. Yeah, and listen, uh, you know, when rates were as low as they were for as long as they were, because, you know, if you really look at it, it's the only thing that really affects what you thought it was valued at yesterday. I mean, right? At the end of the day, that is the kicker of what changes value. And, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't going to last forever, but yet every time we said that it did, uh, I think, you know, if you look at all the change that was able to be made during the last 10 years, you know, cause you're, you're saying like, you know, Robin Hood, I know you were early seed investor in that. And, you know, uh, you, You've been in, you know, from the beginning on a lot of really innovative, cool things. But, you know, the deinstitutionalization, I call it like the trust leap. There was a lot of trust leaps that people had to push themselves to feel because of COVID and all the things that we went through that I don't know if they would have done it as fast. And the acceleration of what the amount people have invested, I don't know if it would have gone as fast, like you said, if it wasn't for COVID. Because, you know, like you said, it just takes time for people to trust anything. And it was all well, new. And, and they were forced to learn. It'd be like saying yes. you got a new Chinese government. You, you got a new Chinese government. Learn Chinese. People had the time. They yeah. had the tools. What they did, what they thought was it was easy. And guess what? I mean, I never told them it was easy. I mean, D- Barstool Dave was telling them stocks only go up. And it was cute and it was pretty funny for about an hour. And then I myself, who was caught up and it was funny, was realizing like, this is not smart. So a lot of people point to, it's easy to point and blame Robin Hood. They're not, they're not uh, a victim in this. They're definitely 
have some responsibility uh, in in creating you know this generation of what do you call them degenerates um but let's be honest like you can walk into a walmart and buy bullets um you know this is a very intricate language that takes people sometimes 10 to 20 years to learn and i don't know what people were exp- who i don't know who thought it was easy but it was they were led to the slaughter and so but, but the people that that, served- that that but that era they they never like it's all the generations and what you've experienced as you you know been through life yeah, i mean the like people they've that- never been through a down market to even know what that was yeah so the people that survived this let's just go forward and think through another three yep. years and hopefully the ukraine situation doesn't escalate which unfortunately it is every day and we get better policy and you know stocks correct as they are to a point where like people go oh i actually could look up the fundamentals because there's free tools to do that and i can actually run a relative screen and figure out okay every stock's down 80 percent, but not every stock should be down 80 yep, percent. so exactly. now we'll enter now now we'll enter the next phase where the 10 to 20 to 30 million people maybe 50 million people around the world that got the bug to learn about investing will be so much smarter for the next fear and greed cycle. So the way I look at it, and of course I'm biased because I made a lot of money by investing in this last onboarding. And that's all we had was just a massive onboarding of new people to the game that is the markets. Um, The next generation of people that play the game are going to be 10 times better there's a much better chance for there to be 10 Warren Buffett's now that millions of people were onboarded. And so, you know, that's the way I like to look at it. And, and it's a little biased view. And there's been a lot of pain the last year. Um, you know, we've kind of been in a tech bear market since maybe March of, of 2021. So we're over a year in a tech bear market um, from peak to trough right now. So it's a real bear market. And, you know, people are learning. You know, you, you, you know, if you go to the Dead Sea in Israel, uh, they tell you don't get in the Dead Sea if you got a cut because, you know, the salt will find the wound. Yeah. And, you know, we're yeah. see, we're seeing in a bear market that like if you got a weakness, the market will find it and the market will crush you. And that's the way the market works. Um, and so so people are actually getting I know it's not fun, but people are actually getting a lesson in how markets work. Listen, my whole podcast is the myth to overnight success. And, you know, yep. I truly believe like you learn so much by not always things going right, but what didn't go right and how do you pivot and how do you actually create longevity and sustainability? So, so knowing that like your whole world are these entrepreneurs, you know, you know, they're just feeling it for the first time. I mean, like the word down round is probably going to get, you know, talked about like once a day at most of these places, right? Cause like they're going to need money, you know, you only raise so much. So, so what would you, what, like what three things or two things would you want entrepreneurs to know now with what's, what's what, with what's happening? Well, I think the number one thing that I, yeah, it's a good question. The number one thing I can't believe entrepreneur, there's such with so many tools, whether, whether it's Robinhood or Coinbase or FTX, to really follow prices and like the markets are so connected, public and private markets have never been more connected, but I've never seen so much ignorance of how to price things. Meaning you've got these private markets like seed stage investors, um, you know, Zoom, like tech stocks are down 70%, like great growth companies that are public stocks. I'm not saying they're, they're undervalued or overvalued, but Zoom at one point, or DocuSign, or Twilio, or uh, the Trade Desk, or Cloudflare, these stocks are all down 70 to 80%. So in a world where that is on everybody's screen, whether it's, you know, Yahoo, or Robinhood, or StockTwits, to not understand how that affects your price as a seed stage company is just like, like forehead smacking insanity. Right. So for the last year and a half, I've been like the angry guy yelling at the TV, the old white guy yelling at the TV saying, 
man, when I was a kid, uh, these prices today are out of whack because, you know, I would talk to a founder and go, you know, Zoom is down uh, 70%. Uh, why is your valuation as a private company where it's 10 years to liquidity hasn't changed? So I think despite all this knowledge and access, I, I can't believe how disconnected um, private markets have been from public markets. And so that's both an opportunity and a problem. And we're all paying for that ignorance right now because everybody's got to kind of catch up to the reality of how to price things. Um, so the number one thing I would tell people is like create a watch list of your favorite, you know, 20 companies in different industries and get used to like understanding how the markets work and how things are priced and the mood of, you know, investors, because if you're out raising money, you know, and you rate, like, there's a lot of kids that I'm talking to that's like, well, you know, I, I raised at this valuation because I could. And I said, great. So you've got this 2021 valuation, but we live in a 2022, 23 world and everything's down 70%. So now you were so excited to raise money at a 25 million valuation because that's what, you know, quote, the market said, but really your valuation should have been six. So unless you spend your money extremely wisely, when you go back to raise your next round, you're going to be surprised by how much dilution that you've taken. Well, and so I think the number one, is it like like I the think founder, it's the, I think the founder how they're going to be motivated now. Like that like that's what I'm worried about. I feel it was yeah. such a big hit on what valuation yeah. was that you know these down rounds, these recasts. You know, if someone was thinking it's 30, 50 million, and now it is 10. How, how do you keep the founder motivated? You don't. And so, I, you know, this is, this is, again, like everybody's talking about Robin Hood, but no one's talking about Tiger. And like, Tiger could basically shut down and walk away. They're down 40, 50%. These are supposedly the best investors in the world. If I'm Tiger, I'm like, wait, I'm never going to get my high water mark. So I might as well shut down and start up Tiger 2.0. So... You know, we haven't even begun to see. Didn't that guy at what Melvin Capital did. try to do that? And then he didn't because like you're sort yeah, of. Yeah, he just tried to say, hey, I'll work for you, but you got to like restructure my deal. And I'm like, no. So hedge funds, as much as we make fun of them, are rather pure uh, forms of capitalism in the sense that, you know, you get paid at a high watermark. And if you don't get paid, you got to earn your way back. I think we're in this huge walk away moment potentially that's scary and i've been you know nibbling here and actually myself buying some tech stocks but man you know i may not be following my own good advice here because we we are in a very dangerous environment where we don't know where all the uh mines or you know we just don't know where all the bodies are buried and where the leverage is and who's down what and sidecars. Well, we know. Side we, we know. It's just we're in, it's denial time. I mean, we. I, if yeah. you just match the public to the pro, I mean, like you said, we're, it's very interconnected, and it's also very interconnected on value. It's just unless you need to raise money, you pretend it, it isn't. So I, I think it's yeah. going to be very interesting. And the, what what you said and what we just the walk away thing is what bothers me, because you know uh, it's very easy to feel you have nowhere to go except nowhere, and then you know. That'll be the true character test of some of these entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, I and I and you asked me about you asked me about stocks. Which, so we started in no way. It's never been easy. We were always in, you know, I just did a lot of things wrong. Uh, we were never properly capital, even though it, it seemed like I had raised a lot of money. I had raised like seven, eight million bucks, you know, in the first few years of the business. You know, that's that's pissing in the wind compared to the Twitters and then the discords and the uh, Reddit's the amount of capital that these companies had raised. So we were always like this weird flavor of the internet. And I think just purely based on the idea that um, we just love stocks and we were this weird wonky group of people. And we were, of course we were in it for the money and we want to make our investors a return, but no matter how much, how miserable the battle was of like dealing with stocks and community. Um, 
we just gutted it out. And today we're, you know, the CEO's done a great job for the last few years, Rishi, but today we're like a profitable business, you know, master of our own domain and in, in a funny, you know, science how, how many years is it, was that 20 years? It's about 13 years now and we're growing faster than ever. We have this great organic community. And that how just many loves times did you think stock. it was over? I never thought it would work. I mean, I, you know, at the beginning, it was easy, right? Everybody says you're going to, I was coming off, you know, Wall Street. So everybody said I was a genius and here's money and no, oh, don't worry about it. You're great. And it wasn't like I believed that stuff, but no one ever gave me, you know, I really didn't know how to recruit. I didn't really know tech. So like my venture capitalists, really smart guys, but really sloppy in how they trusted me which is, you know, fine. Like that's their job is to trust people, but they really didn't arm me with the right weapons and the right, uh, you know, they didn't really take it serious enough. And, you know, guess what? If you're a VC and I'm a VC, the number one thing is to find warriors. And that's people that have domain experience and are willing to be a bear market CEO, like a wartime CEO. And the one thing I had about it is like immense network and true understanding of community and, and growing up in the Yahoo generation, being an E-Trade, you know, person myself, you know, hating on CNBC. So I was the right person to do this and understand it, but I didn't have the, I wasn't, ar I was armed with some capital, but I wasn't armed with here, Howard, here's how you hire a CFO. Howard, here's how you hire a CTO. Here's how you hire a head of product. You know, here's, you know, you need a full team. And I don't think I had the skills. Well, obviously I didn't have the skills. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I, other than understanding how markets work, I would tell, you know, people that want to start their own company, are you prepared to be a ruthless recruiter? Are you prepared to be constantly not working on the things that you want to work on, which is like your product yeah. and the marketing, but also just be interviewing people at 11 at night and like sizing people up to go to battle on your team. And that's really not fun. I don't think that's fun. Like once I knew that was the business, I stepped, I bowed out gracefully and said, well, I wish someone had told me this because I just want to like have big ideas and raise money and tell stories, which is fine. But if you, the great CEOs can do what I do on the storytelling side and can do what I do on the vision side, but they also know how to recruit. They also probably know how to code and they also know how to build product, in a, a, you know, and I wasn't armed with those skills and I didn't hire fast enough, well enough around those things. And once you have that kind of debt, which is, you know, technical debt, it's not financial debt, but it's technical debt. It's really crippling to kind of come out from that. So stock is just kind of more a miracle of like, you know, uh, than anything. So we're really excited. Well, no, I mean, about you, you say that, but I, I mean, I, and I know you're, you're, you're humble, but you made choices. Like you knew what you didn't know. You knew what you didn't think you could achieve and you brought the right people in and it's still here. Cause no matter what you say, it's still here. It's still doing yeah. well. And like you said, it's doing better than it ever did. So, and I think as you, as you grow in business, like, I think it's more important to know what you don't know than what you do know, because that's what but I should have known that. But if someone had told me that is all I'm saying. So you're asking me what kids should know. They know, should yeah. know how the markets are connected. The other yeah. thing you should know is be true to like, they should be true to like forgetting people blowing smoke up your ass and your parents saying you should get a trophy for being wrong. Um, in the real world, you get no trophies for being wrong. You get kicked in the head for being right. And so you got to okay. be prepared for, you know, recruiting. So then, and, and you better be prepared to work 24, seven, 365, because it's uh, the internet is war and, and it's 24, seven, 365, you know, unbelievable grind, digital man. warfare it's a grind, it's a it's a grind. grind. Yeah. so so those are the lessons but yeah we're really proud of stock because we survived and part and half of this is just surviving i love it i love it well yeah. li li listen you survived and, and now you have a chance that's all we do as any of us every day and what we're doing especially 
when you're trying to stay relevant, right? It's easy. If you look at businesses, most of them fail within the first five years. There's a very small percentage that actually make it in adventure and what you do, it's 99% of them. You know, what I love about your podcast, and I first of all, I love your podcast, Panic with Friends. Everyone should listen to this thing. You have just, you know, great guests. You have a great co host. Uh, but you always say, like, people need to lose money. Like, you have to lose, investors should lose yeah. money. You know, why is yeah. that so important to you for real? Because uh, everyone can think that that's a J- Howard joke, right? But you, you obviously no, say it enough, I mean, it's not a joke. Yeah, I, again, like, I'm learning right now. Like, I've never been in a big, I, and I say this because I was like, I thought it was smart. Like I've been telling people for a year to lighten up on stocks. Right. And then here I am like 40% long, maybe like I'm not, you know, I have enough risk in the venture mark stocks in general, but here I am like 40, 45% long because I've been buying here lately and I've never been in a bigger drawdown. Like I've never percentage wise, meaning like half the stocks that I own are down 60%. Like before I could even, like get my bearings. And so (coughs) it's very humbling. And so, you know, everybody thinks everybody's a genius because everybody can shape their own story on Twitter or Instagram or YouTube. But I like to just be a little more uh, honest about stuff and saying, this is a constant battle to stay kind of above ground, not relevant, but stay profitable and stay in the game. And so the sooner you learn what it's like to survive in a bear market, the better. Now, obviously it was fun, you know, as an investor in Robinhood and eToro and stock, it was fun. Like 2020, in, in March of 2020, if you had told me that people were gonna be YOLOing options on Robinhood by like June in GameStop and AMC, there's no bet I would have taken that would have said, that's the bet. So it's not like I saw that coming. I definitely saw Robin Hood as a revolution, but I didn't know it would take COVID to send it into the stratosphere. But it's right? even, listen, so when, yeah, it, it's been happening. What happened in that equity market, right? Which is now more people can invest. They have access to information. Uh, it was the same thing that happened with real estate with the crowdfunding sites, right? There was a law that the, all these new laws have enabled more people to participate, which I think is a great thing. Now we're all going to learn lessons. And, you know, if you're an investor, you need to know you're investing. Like when you hit that button or invest in that deal, you got to realize it could just as much be gone, right? Uh, and nothing goes up uh, completely forever. So I think it's, uh, and it's hard lessons, but, you know, we'll it's hopefully hard. all get through it. Well, we're going to get through it. Listen, that's how markets are made. They go from strong, weak hands to strong hands. So, so, you know, the lesson here is the weak hands are weaker than anybody thought. And the strong hands have prices that are well below where prices are today. That's all we're and, asking. And you know we're there's overshooting, like, right? There's overshooting there's right overshoot- now. There's, I mean, there's overshooting galore. Yes. And so we're in this. And so I consider myself relatively strong hands because I I pick and choose what I want to own. But I got to tell you, I'm ready to throw up because am I am I willing to wait three years uh, for for myself to get profitable in some of these positions? So so we're in this transition period to find out where the strong hands are. And yeah. so there's going to be a lot of churn. There's going to be a lot of churn. There's going to be a lot of throwing up. There's going to be a lot of blaming the referees. Um, I and, think you should change your podcast to don't panic with friends. We, we need to, yeah. maybe, maybe we need yeah, to change well, I mean, the vibe kind of, now. Well, that's kind of the joke. I started it in March 20 and it was like, you know, we're all panicking. So we might as well have a podcast. And I think <laughs> we're, 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 this is a, this the panic in march of 2020 like i said if you had told me it would be over by april i would have laughed you out of the room totally you know i thought i i thought we were in for a shit kicking but i was very bullish at the same time because you know america's america and we were going to figure our way out of it and we had slack and we had zoom blah 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 but here we are in 2022 and i'm not as optimistic 
unfortunately, this time around. I mean, I, I still am long-term optimistic, but at the same time, I'm not as optimistic as I was in March, 2020. Um, so I haven't figured out the full reasoning. Part of it is just the amount of yelling and noise and like vitriol uh, by our leaders. Um, it's kind of like worn us all down. Um, so I'm trying to stay optimistic, but at the same time, I feel like this is a lot worse than March 20. Listen, we went from the pandemic um, to, you know, we skipped the roaring 20s. So, like, so hopefully yeah. the roaring 20s is going to happen after this little panic that we're going to go through with it's with a reset, right? It's it's really a recalibration in my mind. It's a recalibration, but you know, tech, you know, I've been talking to a lot of macro people and tech was you know, it was obvious, like tech had to save us. This time around, it feels like the same assholes that we all agreed were assholes, you know, the warmongers, the missile people, the weapons people, you know what I mean? Like, it seems like this is totally not in tech's hand. It's like tech has no say in how the next 10 years is going to happen because, you know, crypto is still the Wild West and, you know, money needs rails and guardrails and, you know, mean, angry, you know, people are, are fighting are, are like weirdly throwing our supply chains into disarray and tech can't save us from that. And so I worry because I don't want to buy Pepsi and Coca-Cola and McDonald's, you know, that was for another era. And it seems like that's what's like people want me to own stocks like exxon again like it feels like we just got not only did we get a we come up with like a turd of like an ending for the for the uh post-covid tech boom but now we've got like the same overlords that we had in the 70s and 80s and you know that's a little bit disappointing well and i think it's probably just an illusion because I, I mean, it's funny, what's great about having these podcasts and things that now we can go back and listen to from ourselves, right, which we didn't have in the past, is a lot of the time yep. we're living in that moment, we're doing the best we can, and we're mostly wrong, right? I mean, things that we yep. didn't think were going to happen show up, you know, so I, I and I truly believe that uh, I can't help myself, I, I have a positive outlook on America and everything that that we do here and i just think we're all going to get through this it's not it's just not going to feel good a while listen 2008 you thought the you know you fell off a cliff uh if you're in the real estate yeah. business which i am and we ended yep. up getting through it i mean there was a lot of you know strife and turmoil and lots of days you didn't feel yep. too good but there was also a lot of opportunity because you learned like you said at the beginning how to relook at things in a different way plain and simple yeah no and by the way, my handle right now is Optimistic Lindzen. So uh, oh, you I, know, I agree that. with you. Like the, I thought it was the Bahamas yeah, I mean, Lindzen. Bahamas Lindzen. It was the Bahamas, but now I'm, I changed my, you know, based on my mood, I changed my Twitter handle. But you get the joke. Like the I point do. is, I do. We, we live in this miracle of a time where I can be chatting with you. The knowledge transfer is it's insane. Awesome. It's I, insane. It's insane. I was out for dinner with Spencer Dinwiddie last night, who's a fucking power. He was like a great uh, player on the Dallas Mavericks. Just because I hit him up on Twitter because I knew he was coming to Phoenix and we kind of follow each other and blah, blah, blah. He's into crypto. And, you know, I'm talking NBA with like a guy who's playing tonight with the Mavs and I'm just some shlomo with the. Uh, but like we're transferring knowledge about the NBA and crypto and angel investing and like. NBA players are investing in angel rounds and doing crypto and they're paying their agents 2% instead of 10%. So you have all this incredible knowledge transfer and you have this incredible decrease in the cost of doing business because, you know, the price of transactions has dropped. And here we are still complaining. Well, it's, it's so ideation, make... right? Like you, you, you get, we're only as good as what our experiences were until we learn something new to apply them to. I mean, that's the fun part, right? That's what being an entrepreneur means. And that's why you're still doing what you're doing. So to, to, to end this, because we could speak for hours. So now that you've been where you've been, you're going where you're going, like what, what really defines success for you? 
uh, you know, you've been through well, ups have, and downs. It's a, yeah, so the, yeah, so it's a great question because we talk about it all the time. It's, again, like a dinner last night with Spencer. He's 29 years old. He just signed a big contract. He's not an, an all-star by any man, but he's a good player. Yeah, you know, he's his, yep. he's a kinesiologist. Like he's taking care of his body. His one job is to take care of his body. He's yep. 29 years old. He signed a three-year, $30 million contract. He's probably got another couple contracts out there if he stays healthy. So he's 29 years old. Yeah. Now, he knows his career is short. But these kids now, he's 29. My daughter is 26. I'm 24. She's living in New York. She's making 60 grand a year. She's probably paying 40, almost 50 grand a, a year in rent. And so this is the world we live in. Like, the, the being able to chip in and help out because unless we chip in these kids are all bankrupt you know because not everybody's going to be an nba player or a, or a youtube star so my daughter has got a degree no school debt uh, but wants to live like a young woman's life in new york is going to be underwater so like we need to mentor and kind of chip in and help this next generation find a job They've been screwed over in the sense that like college costs are stupid. Um, the well, game they is missed kind two of years of internships. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I think, they missed two terrible. years. There's no terrible. mentoring. There's no, yep. there's no mentoring. They're working from bed. So no I one think, wants like, to go to the my, office anymore to mentor. I mean, like this whole thing's unraveling yeah. for their generation, I think. Yeah. So you asked me what success would be. It would yep. be just making sure that my kids and their friends and the people they care about have access to jobs and careers and kind of just pay it forward that way. Cause these kids are pretty smart. Like they're all really smart and they all want to work, but they've been conditioned to work from their bedroom and talk on Slack with emojis and they don't want to, but that's what they know. And we need to get them back in the workforce, like feeling good about contributing, you know, totally productive yeah and so we guys like us need to convince our kids like i told my daughter i said get your ass out of the house get back to well only six people are going into the office i go well you be the seven yeah you know what i mean i like, agree even if it means you're staring at the walls you be the seven just show up and we need to get I, that's kids a great back. advice it's it's, it's true yeah, too we, because we, we need to, yeah not, we need to get these kids we need to get these kids mentored showing up learning by doing um because it's not just a digital world nope. out there there's face there's face to face and all this stuff so so a measure of my success is making sure that we get, get this next generation like launched well that's because you're a great guy and i'm so happy you uh took the time to come on to my show and my podcast and again uh much appreciated and Hopefully I'll see you soon when you come visit New York, visit your daughter. You'll, you'll let me know. And again, Howard, thank you so much. And Howard, how do people find you? Panic with friends. How else can they? Yeah, it's you? easy to search. You can search schmuck on the internet, a picture of me shows up. You can search my name, Howard Lindzen, L-I-N-D-Z-O-N. I have, you know, I, I write daily at my blog, howardlinzen.com. Uh, it's my same, I'm not hiding out. You can look me up on Twitter, same name. So it's easy to find me and say hello. And I love goofing off, talking about the markets and investing. So uh, you kind of, it's the same shtick every day. Well, I read your, uh, I read your newsletter every day. I love it. It's, uh, it's terrific. So Howard, again, thank you very much. And I'll see you soon. I appreciate it.